This is an awesome time in the history of the world. It is entirely possible that we are approaching our doom. I wish to speak as a citizen of the United States, loyal to its principles and ideals. I wish to speak as a psychologist, devoted to the enhancement of personal growth and the improvement of human relationships. I want to voice my deep concern regarding the growing likelihood of nuclear war. This is the opening paragraph from a 1982 paper by preeminent psychologist Dr. Carl Rogers, appearing in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology, titled A Psychologist Looks at Nuclear War, Its Threat, Its Possible Prevention. I'm Dr. Stan Steindl, and I try to make little videos about compassion and self-compassion and an approach to psychotherapy called Compassion Focused Therapy, or CFT. Last week, I offered a kind of plea, compassion, not war. But now war has begun, and I feel very uneasy about simply returning to making fun little videos about CFT, etc. We all need to bring our attention to what's happening in Ukraine, the unprovoked and completely unnecessary invasion by Russia, the dislocation, destruction, injury and death being suffered by real people. From all the way over here, we in Australia find it difficult to know what to do. I've made a donation to the Red Cross. I've reached out personally to people I know in Russia and Eastern Europe to send my care and support. But in Ukraine right now, millions are fleeing and men aged 18 to 60 years are being commanded to stay and fight. So I turn to my professional hero. What might Carl Rogers have to say about war and what to do about it? And there were some revelations in the paper I quoted above that I would like to share, and some modern challenges as well. Back in 1982, we were in the midst of a Cold War. The US and Russia were deeply and painfully embroiled in a nuclear arms race, almost to the point where the things politicians were saying made nuclear war sound inevitable. Rogers quotes the then US Vice President George Bush as believing nuclear war was winnable. But when asked by a journalist at the Los Angeles Times what he meant, he said, you have a survivability of command and control, a survivability of industrial potential, protection of a percentage of your citizens, and you have a capability to inflict more damage on the opposition than they can inflict upon you. That's the way you can have a winner. Like 5% would survive, 2%? Experts at the time thought as many as 15% of people might survive. That meant 85% died. And those who survived would be in terrible conditions. And that would be winning. And all of this was having a terrible impact back then. For example, Rogers mentions his granddaughter, Frances Futchers, who was presumably following in his footsteps in psychology and education and who asked young people at the time where they thought they would be in five years' time. One adolescent said, I believe in five years, if Reagan hasn't gotten us blown up, that our natural resources will either disappear or they will be very difficult to get hold of. I really think that in five years, I will be dead or really, really badly off. War, even the threat of war, creates great consternation for everyone, but probably for our young people most of all. Back then, there was this lingering threat of nuclear war, and everyone felt like they had a constant axe hanging over their heads, waiting for it to fall. Now we have war in Ukraine, and that is devastating and heartbreaking. And we have a threat of war breaking out in Europe. Where are things going to go from here? We have the question of nuclear weapons 
So that feels back on the table. What might Carl have to say about what to do? Well, obviously he wasn't able to offer a magic solution. We are humans after all, and we can be crazy. In that last video last week, I talked about the problem of our tricky brains and our propensity towards competition, conflict, callousness and cruelty. And that's truly on full display. But here is something Carl said that perhaps is worth hearing and heeding. We know a great deal about how to establish communication between hostile and feuding groups and to aid them in the reconciliation of their interests and desires. And he went on to say, I would like to point out the psychological pattern that exists in such a situation. The pattern is always fundamentally the same. One group feels it is perfectly clear that we are right and you are wrong. We are good and you are bad. Consequently, the only possible solution to the problem is our solution, X. But the other group has identical feelings. We are right and you are wrong. We are good and you are bad. Consequently, the only satisfactory solution to the problem is our solution, Y. One of the greatest difficulties in any dispute is to recognize and even more difficult to accept that the certitude we feel about our own rightness and goodness is equaled by the certitude of the opposing group about its rightness and goodness. If tension is to be reduced, it is this pattern that must somehow be dissolved. Here is where a facilitative approach has often been successful. He is so right, but gosh, that seems so difficult. In this day and age, the opposing groups just seem to have diverged to the extremities of their positions. Within our own societies, there is terrible divergence, us and them positioning and so on. And between different societies, West versus East, democratic versus authoritarian, etc., etc. Well, they just seem worlds apart. Rogers gave some examples of what can be accomplished by experienced facilitators. He had worked in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and successfully aided in the communication between Protestant and Catholic groups there. He commented on other negotiations at the time, such as those facilitated by President Jimmy Carter at Camp David. He said, by accepting hostile and divergent opinions, some of the hostility directed toward the facilitators themselves, the most irrational of the feelings are somewhat diffused by being fully expressed and by feedback from group members. Little by little, understanding and acceptance of other points of view develops. Confidence grows both in the individual and in the group. There is a more realistic consideration of the issues with less overload of irrationality. The group moves toward innovative, responsible, and often revolutionary steps, steps that can now be taken in an atmosphere of realism. A little later, he said, on the basis of these experiences, I feel it is not too much to say that if feuding parties are willing to meet in the same room and willing even to talk at each other, Steps toward better understanding and more constructive actions are almost certain to ensue. If there are skilled facilitators present who can understand and accept the diverse, hostile, fearful attitudes that are expressed. Perhaps there's hope. And the thing is that all around the world, everyday people are starting to make themselves heard. Millions and millions of people do not want war. And the fact is that millions of Russians also do not want war. I have many wonderful colleagues and friends in Russia, and they do not want this war. We have seen protests on the streets there, people against this war. Sadly, it's very unsafe to protest in Russia, and many people have been arrested. But around the world, people are saying no to war. There is a great uprising to bring an end to war. John Lennon, my other hero, 
has said, declare it. Just the same way we declare war. That is how we will have peace. We just need to declare it. Rogers quotes President Dwight Eisenhower, who said, Someday the demand for disarmament by hundreds of millions will, I hope, become so universal and so insistent that no man, no men can withstand it. We have to mobilise the hundreds of millions. We have to make them understand the choice is theirs. We have to make the young people see to it that they need not be the victims of the Third World War. Maybe someday is today. Rogers said, we need to communicate with the Russian people. We need to try to understand their point of view. We need to help them understand our point of view. We need to dialogue with them at official and unofficial levels. This will not be easy to achieve, but in meetings of government officials, in professional conferences, in business contacts, and with Russian visitors, we need to encourage dialogue. Experienced facilitators, where needed, can be drawn from other countries. I noticed in the news that China has advocated dialogue. I realise this feels a bit fraught, but perhaps people in the West are in fact not best placed to be facilitators in this instance. I don't know. I wish I did, but I don't. But maybe there is something there. Either way, perhaps Rogers would be advocating some sort of facilitated dialogue. Carl Rogers wrote this piece in 1982. How much things have progressed since then, and how little they've progressed. He concludes his article by saying, We have very little time. This is a life and death issue for all of us. Can we stop the drift toward destruction? We all have a responsibility in answering this question. It is to carry out my personal share of this responsibility that I have spoken out so strongly. I intend to continue. I hope you will join me and millions of others in working for a stop to our terrible insanity, the trend towards nuclear war. All of this remains true today. No ordinary person going about their day wants war, nuclear or otherwise. Let's join Rogers and so many millions of others, band together and work towards stopping our terrible insanity. Peace and love to everyone.